I wanted to first and foremost uh, tell you that, that I sincerely yep. appreciate this opportunity to speak with everyone and to uh, and to listen and to get your feedback. The the whole hope was to um to to come and and uh, to talk to uh, the members of the Montpelier Police Department and to um, to especially speak to the people of Montpelier and to find out what it is that we're doing right, what are some of the things are that some of our challenges, and, and especially what your expectations are of me and of our department as we move forward and to develop a strategic plan in partnership with the communities that we're sworn to serve. So um, what, what we'd like to do is I'd like to, again, open it up and, and um, definitely answer any questions and, and, and take any feedback. Um, that way I can roll it into a, a, our strategic plan and once we develop the strategic plan, we'd like to put it in there for, um, put it out uh, with timelines as well. So with these timelines, uh, we're gonna categorize everything under the six pillars of 21st century policing. And um, so like say, for example, if, if one of the, uh, um, well, one of our, I know one of our strategic goals is going to continue on with a, um, a social worker, an embedded social worker between Washington County, uh, Montpelier, and uh, and Barry uh, to, to service the entire um, uh, um, county. So, you know, what I would do in that strategic planning is, is put that in there and say, by such and such month, this is what we plan on. Uh, this is when we hope our social worker to be here and fully trained and moving forward. And that way, um, uh, folks can know and, and keep it as a living, breathing document so everyone can see what we're planning to do um, and, and, and how, how, how far we are moving towards our desired goals. So with that, I'd, I'd like to, to pretty much open it up to anyone who, who maybe wants to ask a question or give any feedback, and, and I'm ready to go, ready to write. Who's a cat? Look. Oh, cool. Who are these people? Oh, there's Sean. There's Shane. Us. <laughs> yes, Joanna. An old lady. I guess my but, question but, is, what I mean, you it's been on, on, yeah, on yes. in such a short time, but um, what have you learned? You've had a couple of other conversations, and I'm sure you've been talking to different agencies uh, and people in the in the community. What have what have you learned? And is there anything that uh, surprises you about Montpelier? Um, what I've learned so far is that um, everything that I thought the community and the department to be is exactly what it is. That the Montpelier Police Department has a very stellar and strong reputation for being a leader in 21st century policing practices and, and community service and partnerships with its community. Um, with, you know, nationwide and coming here and actually seeing it, um, it, it, it's pretty awesome. There are places that, that I've been to that um, it's like, hey, here it is, this is what we do. And, and then when you kind of get down into the weeds of it, it's, it's, it's almost like a talking point. It's like, yeah, this is what we're supposed to do, but here's what we do. And, uh, but in my one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, the members of this department so far, it's been, been pretty emotional because I can see and feel the love that they have to serve this community. And, um, and, and that's, that's extremely inspiring to me. Um, one of the things that I'm not gonna say surprised me, but I'd say was like, it's like jumping into, um, jumping into a pool was the level of involvement and advocacy uh, that the citizens of this city have the very high levels of expectation that continue to push uh, government and our agencies forward. And it's, and it's, it's, I was awestruck. So it's, um, it, it's a place that when I came here and then the more I got to see people, the more I said, hey, if my, my game has got to be a game to be here because uh, no one here expects less and no one here deserves less. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell, sir. Hi, so um, thanks for being here. And I, I just, um, I, I, I'd like, I, this would be helpful to hear your thoughts about use of force policies and de-escalation de techniques. And I think it's helpful to ask you because you haven't been involved with some of the history here, but I know it's a big issue for any police department, so. Okay. 
So with um, with use of force, um, I, um, I'd say that um, that police departments must, you know, it, it, nobody wants to use force, and that should always be a last last option or resort. Um, so there's there, there's a spectrum of a use of force cycle that you know starts with present and, and you know hopefully never ends to the other end of that that level. But um, so I don't I think that officers have to be extremely diligent in making sure that we don't allow our emotions to overtake what it is that we're here to do. And um, so, so that that does mean like with the current legislation that we have that's um, that it makes it and it makes it clear that, that there's duty to intervene when an officer sees another officer going overboard, no matter what agency. Um, that we avoid uh, things like chokeholds, and, and to my knowledge, Montpelier has never taught chokeholds. The state of Vermont has never taught chokeholds. But then it comes into a tricky area when you're talking about the use of deadly force. Um, so, but I, I believe that um, we we want to de-escalate instead of escalate. And from what I've seen and from what I've known and from what I've heard from other departments that the Montpelier Police Department is known as the most polite department. So MPD, not Montpelier Police, it's the most polite. And, um, <laughs> and, and I'll take that reputation within our community because um, traditionally law enforcement has had a very type A persona, um, very uh, alpha male, if you will, dominated. And we want to definitely steer away from that. And I found that the culture of this department is, is based on that. It, it actually pushes people out that if they're not a fit to serve and to, and to, to, to go through de-escalation. So, but in, in the overall scheme of things, while I'm at the, the training academy, I'm, I've been there this week and, and we just went over use of force today. And then I have one more week of training, but I think that the culture of, of, of law enforcement agency starts with the training. And, um, and it has to be emphasized. It can't be one of those things that we learn something in the academy and it's like, you know, you will go out there and you will respect the community. You will be professional. You will do all these different things that we're trying to strive for. But then once you get out to the streets and somebody says, forget what you learned in the academy, kid, this is the real way it goes. And that's the kind of culture that we can't have. But from what I've seen with the state of Vermont thus far, there are, there are improvements that I, that I think that I could, you know, some feedback that I have, but from what I see from the state of Vermont, overwhelmingly does push uh, um, a culture of professionalism um, and, and things that have been 21st century policing practices and it's been doing them for years, but it has its struggles with financing and, and everything else like every other agency within the state. Okay. But I'm a very big advocate to make sure that we don't go overboard. Okay. Yeah. Just, oops. Or go I'm ahead, sorry. Carolyn. I'm sorry. Carolyn. No, I joined you? late too. And then this, uh, then uh, uh, Shana, or may I call you Shana? Okay, great. Uh, Carolyn? Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first is how will the uh, social worker be involved? And the other one is I don't follow the police logs very much, but when I see them, I see things like um, somebody spit on the sidewalk. Um, there's a tree, cat up the tree, uh, all of these really relatively minor nuisance of events in my eyes. I mean, to the person who's witnessing them, they're not a nuisance, but they don't seem like anything that should involve the police. Are you going to come up with some way of weeding those out and directing them to somebody else? Uh, okay, so very two very, very good questions. So regarding the uh, the embedded social worker, the current vision is to um, is to have the social worker with uh, doing some time in Barrie, doing some time in Montpelier. So just um, moving moving that back and forth, but to be embedded within the department, have access to our records, know our officers, know our staff, know everything and how we operate. And then if we get calls that are regarding um, mental health services, crisis to those effect, that the social worker come with us to help, um, pretty much to help. So if there's somebody that, that's identified that can, um, you know, that they can use other social service resources rather than uh, police response, that's the whole idea is to just do a safe handoff and, and to, uh, to be there to uh, just to facilitate it, to hopefully make sure nobody falls through the cracks. Um, that's my uh, understanding of the broad overview of it. I believe that they have 
uh, Washington County Mental Health is going to be the homestead for that position. I think that they've already posted that position, so I'm not sure how many people they have that have, may have applied for it yet. Um, and then with the uh, with police law, absolutely. One of the <coughs> things I'd like to do is um, I understand that the city is currently um, looking over municipal codes, the laws, everything that are in like chapters 10 and 11 is what I'm what I understand. Um, and looking at municipal codes and what what I guess enforcement measures, if you will. And and I'd like to go through that just to make sure that um, what are the things that the public wants us to respond to. And and because the presence of an officer, unfortunately, sometimes can escalate situations, and we're aware of that. We don't want to come into a situation that um, that that may not require a level of enforcement. Because if it escalates to the point that some, that that we go, unfortunately, hands on, what we say in our career field is like, why go hands on for something that I guess would be minor? Uh, you would would be. Um, uh, like say for, I'm not saying this is minor, but say for example, if someone is, it calls the police because uh, someone in a, in, a, in a business is not wearing their mask. How do we respond to that? What should we do? Is that, is that correct for us? Because if that situation elevates, that's not going to look well for the department. It's not going to look well for the city. And it's just something, you know, we just plainly don't want to be involved in uh, getting the potential uh, physical altercations over something that's in the grand scheme of things. Uh, uncontrollable at our level. So um, it, it is something that we want to take very good care of. It's something that law enforcement has for, for, for decades been wanting to, to do. But unfortunately, as society has been cutting budgets and other social service agencies, um, all of that's fallen back to us. What I understood this today, I was told that there was um, a mental health facility that had 160 something beds. But when Irene came, um, yeah already on a 16 and then they cut the entire facility down and now people who need help are out there on the streets and the first call that that's going to happen if you see somebody in mental crisis duress you may not know who that person is something may not may look a little bit scary or intimidating you're going to call 911 and we have to respond to that but on the other side of that we better recognize what we see when we respond so I'm looking at bringing in a full crisis intervention team training system here. I don't think that we have one in the state. I plan to have Montpelier be the first, not only for the, for the officers and civilians and dispatchers within our department, but to offer this training for uh, police agencies at no cost as best as I can so we can get other officers in our state trained. So if, we, if, um, if, if, they're, if, if we're lacking resources in other places, I think it's incumbent upon our department for anything that we force blessed with to try to spread that out to give that same level of training and experience to other law enforcement brothers and sisters in our communities. Um, my experience with the police logs is, is that there's a lot behind those things. You may see something that sounds really innocuous, but there's probably something good sized behind it. Yeah, when they code those things up, it's not necessarily, you know, it, it's, uh, we had one incident at church in February and the way it was coded, it sounded like absolutely nothing, but it was something. Um, and the state's decision to get rid of um, that building in Waterbury was not one of their smarter things. It's been happening, I've seen it, it's happened in New Mexico, it's happened in Illinois, all, every other place that I've been to, and it's unfortunate because uh, now we're, now as a society, now we're, we're going to end up dealing out, if, if the concern for that is, is money, now we're going to end up dealing out a lot more money and unintended consequences and trying to fix the problem than if we would have kept the, the systems that we had in place and made them better. So I'm a huge advocate for all that. And, and uh, to answer the other part of that question would be, I, I wanna look at trying to bring aboard an online reporting system um, that hopefully can minimize, it can document um, instances or, or, or occurrences, but um, it, it would require less police presence. Uh, the, uh, but the thing about that one is it also costs money. So I'm working to see if I can find grants in perpetuity. I just wanted to go back to your questions about um, what you were talking about with chokeholds. Can I, is it okay if I head back oh, there yes, real quick? Okay. Please. 
Um, yeah, you just, you said that um, chokeholds were not taught in Montpelier and I didn't know that. I guess I wasn't like how, um, like, cause I thought also all the kind of teaching and training happens at the state level, right? And so like, are, uh, did they happen in Montpelier? I also know that they were recently banned in state legislation. And so just like when that will go into effect and, um, you know, kind of, of like what that means for chokeholds in Montpelier and um, yeah. And also, you know, just, um, you know, heard, I ha haven't been able to listen to last week's um, these things yet, but um, did hear on DPR um, about that chokeholds like could be warranted if, um, you know, if, if officers are in an environment where they felt it was necessary. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, we've seen officers use fatal chokeholds who believe that they're really justified in using them. And so just, you know, how do, knowing kind of where things are at now, ensure that your team does not think that these tactics are justifiable in, in minor cases or, or petty crimes, like, um, you know, what happened with George Floyd and Eric Garner. Yeah, um, very, very good questions. The um, Yeah, it, it is a statewide training sequence that goes on. So um, chokeholds aren't taught in the academy um, as something that, hey, if, if, if you get into a situation that you, you, you're you required to use physical force for compliance or for an arrest, um, I, they don't teach chokehold. I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm at the, I've only been there for coming on a week now, but it's something I know that they don't teach. Anything that involves the head, neck, or spine, any, 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 physical contact to either one of those three institutes deadly force. And uh, so, so the, the thing with, with current chokeholds is it's, it's one of those things that as much as you try to avoid it, you hope that it never happens. But with, if, if it's a situation that, that deadly force is, is required, is authorized to save the life of the officer or someone else, um, then to me, I would say, what's the difference in being able to shoot that person as opposed to putting that, uh, using a chokehold, at least with a chokehold, it, once the fight's over, it needs to stop. It needs to go away. Now, I'm not advocating that's the main go-to thing, but um, in those situations, it's uh, under the current law, if an officer is fighting for their life, then they go to use a chokehold and then they can be charged with, with, a, with a felony crime even if they would be authorized or justified, quote unquote, to shoot that person or even, you know, hit them with a hunk of steel, which is the ass. So I think ultimately what it boils down to is it has to be culture. It has to be, um, I know it's, it's not gonna be a popular thing to say, but it, it, it has to make sure that it's a culture that, that works on the institution of it um, and, and that attacks what, what traditionally has been personalities within our career, within our profession that have given us the black eye and the, the comeuppance that we're eating right now. And um, it is incumbent upon people like me um, to make sure that we establish, that we hold ourselves and we hold, and the public holds us accountable to make sure that we don't do things like that. Now, absolutely, chokehold shouldn't be used in a, in a non-deadly situation. Why the hell would you use a chokehold on somebody if you're trying to gain control of them and put them in handcuffs and they're not fighting back? You deserve to go to jail for that. Um, but it, 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 there's some trickiness there when it comes to instances that are uh, that may require the use of deadly force and yeah knowing that the state just voted on this right and um i assume that the, you know the state's going to be coming the the legislature is going to bring up a lot of this stuff again you know and, and i think they're coming back in the fall or, or in the um next year um you know if it comes up again I, you know you're in montpelier um you know would you lobby in favor of chokeholds or like moving forward i mean it sounds like you, you, you know, stand by, stand by uh, that. I, 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 yeah, I'd never lobby for the use of chokeholds for an outright uh, 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 move. But I would say that we need to be wise in how we apply it because if, if it's in a situation where deadly force is authorized, then at that point you're, you're in a fight for your life. Um, and you're going to have to do whatever you can. I'm sorry, Michael, did you, you, you raise your hand, sir? You're muted, Michael. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a different topic. Is that all right? 
Um, I was just, you, uh, you have probably heard that Barry has just voted, the Barry City Council just voted to create a citizens advisory board. And I, I'd like to hear your uh, response or your thoughts about having a similar kind of uh, citizen oversight uh, in Montpelier. I, I definitely would welcome a, a, a board in which we have um, citizens uh, that, can, that can keep an eye on the, 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 the types of things uh, that we're doing within the department for partnership, how we develop strategic plans, um, what types of disciplinary things that we found just to make sure that we're consistent across the board um, when we get complaints, those types of things to bring all these numbers and to bring all these stati uh, statistics um, to the board. Uh, to show them where we're at as far as how we're moving towards our strategic goals and what our plans are. I think it's a little tricky when it comes into um, boards that that outright control a police department um, because there are certain aspects of the job. This job is extremely intertwined. So I think for something like that, I think it would require a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of discussion and, and understanding of, of what the responsibilities and roles of such a board would be. And uh, that would be, in, in my opinion, something that has to be discussed at the, uh, at the city council board. Because then also, again, that this, even if the board makes a recommendation or wants to do something with the department, it's ultimately going to fall on the responsibility of the elected officials. So the question of, you know, the, the sense of responsibility or who's gonna be accountable. Uh, for what happens within a department. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Stevens, sir. Hi, good evening. Can good evening. you guys hear me okay? It's great to have you. Welcome to Montpelier. Thank I'm you. really glad to have you. Um, I read an article in the, in the Los Angeles Times um, last week where they analyzed um, 911 calls and they found that about 92% of calls to the police did not actually need um, did not need uh, a response by people who are authorized to use force. So in other words, only 8%, less than 8% apparently were reports of violent crimes, which they described as homicides, assaults, robbery, shots fired and rape. So that sort of sounds like 90% of calls to the police ought not to go to the police. And 8% of those calls really ought to go to the police, to people who are authorized to use force. That's a pretty stark statistic. What are your thoughts about how going forward, you might be able to, to have dispatch that would be able to channel those 90% of calls to a social worker and, and of the calls to the police. And also, how are we going to deal with that if we've got only one social worker, but 14 or 15 or 16 police officers, when it perhaps seems like the ratio ought to be different? I guess it depends on which types of calls for service that, um, and keeping in mind that even though you the worker, there's a lot of there's a that's a tip of the iceberg. There has to be a lot of resources in place to uh, to continue that mental health service for someone. So a social worker may pick it up from the front, but what happens if you have uh, if the individual who's in crisis doesn't have access to uh, for, for money to get prescriptions? So how do you help them uh, get get all of that information? How, how how do you go through that entire system? And that's not something that of course I don't think that the police should be dealing with it. It's something we should be separate from. Um, but at the same time, these things have been going on for so long and police departments, I don't think you'll find a police department anywhere in the United States. And if you did, you need to take a really hard look at who's running it that would absolutely insist that we respond to every call. Um, because th the truth is we don't need to, and we shouldn't. Um, but, but unfortunately, certain places might have certain policies which do require that. So someone, you know, I, I think it, it's, certain, it's gonna be at all levels. It's gonna be educating the public to let the public know these are the types of calls that we're no longer gonna respond to, but then what happens when the complaints roll in? Well, the police ignored my complaint and they didn't wanna come, or, or if, if a social worker is called, the social worker may turn right around and say, I think it sounds like a crisis situation from the call we got. We need the police to go there anyway to deescalate the situation because most social workers aren't gonna come in into the situation if they think there's a, pot a, a potential risk of injury. 
So we would be called in to de-escalate the situation again. So it's 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 going to come towards a partnership uh, to figure out what all our intertwined agencies to figure out who's where the boundaries are, and and to understand each other's points of view and move forward. And I think Montpelier is pretty fortunate in the fact that it already does have very, very strong relationships with like the Washington County Mental Health. So, so those are folks that are extremely committed to doing their jobs. And I, I, from, from what I understand, they do their jobs extremely well. What I know about Mary Moulton, man, that, she's on fire. And uh, so, but it's, it's just one of those things that I think that it's going to take a long, hard look and it's going to take some time and, and some patience on everybody's parts to find out where the good fits are um, to make sure that we go forward with that. And yeah, I do think that, um, uh, it, it will start with again us looking at some of the codes that we're we're responding to and trying to figure out what services, if any, may be more better suited to deal with. I think in Montpelier we benefit to some extent from the fact that we're small and the police get to know the residents. And sometimes they know people and they know how to handle people because they know them. It's not like they're coming, always coming upon somebody that they don't know at all. Um, they get, it, as long as they're out and about and, and, you know, checking in on people, they get to know people and they get to know what, what's up and what's Well, not. that I mean, might be the case, but we still have one of the worst incarceration rates in the nation. So five to I, one ratio. So the being small in and of itself doesn't seem to stop black and brown people from getting sent to prison at a higher rate than 45 other states in this in this country. Well, I wasn't talking overall. I was talking, you know, just this city benefits from the fact that we're small. I mean, overall, there is a problem. And I, I would agree with you. Overall, there, there, there are, it's multifaceted. I don't think it's just one. Um, the police have to do its part in changing its cultural institution. No, no doubt about that. But there are other things that also have to be done, looked at, and addressed uh, to turn the systemic tide around in its entirety. So, um, so yeah, we need to be held accountable for what our responsibilities are, but we also need to be um, doing what we can to be in, involved in those discussions to make sure that we look at our institutions as a whole and make sure that they're equal and fair across the board. Yes, Michael. Can you talk to, to us a little bit about um, what you know about the recruiting process uh, at the department and what your criteria are, what you're looking for when you um, are interviewing and, um, and how successful that has been and what changes you think you might be looking at? I know it's a little early to say that, but, but just what, what's going on in the, in the recruiting now uh, that you'd like to talk about? Well, I, I think for, for right now, Montpelier is, is a lot. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's budgeted for an authorized strength of sworn police officers for 17, I believe. And so we are at our current maximum strength, if you will. Um, but from what I understand about the recruiting process here is when there's a position that is uh, a, a vacancy, we, we, we put the information out within the community and across the state. Um, but I also think, I'm not sure if it's advertised uh, nationally on places like the IACP or the International Organ or Association of Chiefs of Police or LinkedIn or, or, or I'm not sure which media is that we're using to see what we can attract. But I think that we need to start applying or start putting those, um, uh, those posts in places like like Noble, which is the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, there's a Hispanic uh, a Police Officers Association, Women in Law Enforcement Institute. There are a whole bunch of other diverse places that we need to make sure that we, we span out and that we, we look to attract uh, officers to come in to our community so we can better diversify. Uh, 
Um, once, once we collect a certain amount of applicants, uh, to my knowledge, uh, then there become there comes a screening process, and then it's dwindled down to uh, to individuals, and then it comes to one-on-one -on -one interviews. I think that maybe we should look at trying to get some type of a, a community involvement again, if you will, because. Uh, I think that the public needs to see the types of police officers, you know, to pick and choose the police officers that it wants. If there's one thing I've learned about this place, again, there are expectations and we want the best. And, uh, and I think that the public should have, have, a, have a say so in that. So whether we do like panel interviews to bring folks in, that's something that we should, we should be looking at. Uh, but once a person is selected, uh, there's a background check, there's a polygraph check. And if anyone's ever had a polygraph done, it is like the most uncomfortable thing in the world because they go back on everything. Um, so I, I think there is, it, there's a very stringent process. But where what I've seen so far in the state that kind of gives me a little bit of pause is um, how the state, and I'm not going to put this on the academy because the academy is doing everything it can. It's extremely underfunded and it's extremely under, under, uh, under, uh, but personnel. Uh, there aren't enough people there to do, to do that job. But when you have a traditional police training is anywhere from 100 to 120 hours to maybe in some places 160 hours worth of training, but you have a part time position in which uh, people who want to come in law enforcement that as soon as they graduate a two week training course that used to be one week. They're authorized to be out there and to uh, to carry a weapon. Um, to patrol and to respond to calls for service. Now that's not a knock on the men and women that step up for that uh, that responsibility. I admire them and I think they're good. But I think that at the same time, um, the state is setting them up for failure. And, um, and it's something I think that uh, we should take a long, hard look at. And from what I understand in some of those cases, um, it's because of there is a, there is a, a drastic need for a law enforcement um, in especially the more rural areas. So there are challenges in, in, in cost prohibition or um, cost restrictions for, for um, sheriff's departments and other agencies in getting people trained and then getting them back out there on the road. So it's, um, it's a it's a pretty intertwined system, but I'm doing my best to learn as much as I can about it, and then um, it, I'll do whatever I can to bring it up to the to the to the chiefs, uh, groups, to the commissioners, and and uh, to say these are the things that I've seen and from an outside perspective, and hopefully we can all come together. And if they if they are problems, we can all come together to fix them. Thank you. I I have a question, if I may. I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Uh, my, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry yeah. if I stepped in on somebody. I don't. My camera is not on, and I can't raise my hand. No. Okay, Karen. And then I see uh, the Eichenberries. Okay. Um, I struggle with police shooting to kill. That's basically the short version of the 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 my worries. I see so many people just dying. Like, is how how do officers get taught uh, when it comes to shooting at people? Can they shoot in the leg? Can they shoot in the shoulder? Does it have to be dead? Uh, no, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, officers should not be shooting to kill anybody. They should be shooting to, to incapacitate. They should be shooting to a threat. Now, I know that sounds cold, but there are situations out there in life that, we, that we're the ones that are called to deal with extremely violent situations and, and nobody wants to go out there and be involved in that. I've never wanted to be involved in, in fights, let alone arguments. Um, but it's, it's when those, those scenarios happen, um, there is a, a tremendous amount of stress. There is a tremendous, there are, there are split decisions made on little knowledge and little information. And um, so, you know, fine motor skills, tunnel vision, sweating, I mean, I can, the, the list goes on and how, how officers are dealing with those situations, but it's a, it's a trained to, it's, it's a trained to incapacitate just to shoot. It's not that it's, it's hard to shoot a target, let alone a leg or an arm. And, and in those cases, especially if you have somebody shooting back at you, um, you're only shooting to incapacitate uh, the individual. You should not be shooting to kill. Yeah. And, and, and if you are fortunate enough to win that gunfight, the first thing that you need to do is is to render first aid. 
Thank you. It, it just seems like so many of the stories that we hear are people that aren't shooting back. They're people that are standing there, you know, the, and, and don't seem, at, um, at, from what we get to see, they don't seem like a threat and still they wind up dead. No, I, I understand that that, that that that's put out there, but there are also situations in which I've had friends shot in the back of the head and did nothing. Yeah. So there's 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 a lot of there's unfortunately there's a lot of violence in this world. I wish there were ways to, to cure it. And I think that it is incumbent upon us, especially when we're think dealing with things like mental health. You know, God damn it, pardon my language, but we 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 need to make sure that that we do our best to make sure yeah. things aren't slipping quote unquote through those cracks. Because if I can on the front end deal no. with somebody who is going through a mental health crisis and get them help, get them medication and do everything I can, assuming that they take it. Um, but I'd rather have all that on the front end than have them going through a crisis that if a family calls and says, I can't control my son or my daughter, um, and we have to come there, that's the, that's the I'd be scared too, because you don't know who you're gonna get with that call. Yeah. We'll tell you with the Montpelier Police Department, you're going to get the best trained people that we can. Uh, the, the best training we can give them, um, the guidance and the culture that that tries to push our officers to get out there when we can, uh, to get to know the people of the community, because I'm going to be very much less inclined to use physical force on someone who I know. I know your father, I know your daughter, and and, and that's, again, that's, that's a cultural push that we need to go out there and that we need to make sure that we have happen, and we're going to do that as best as we can in this department. Thank you, mm -hmm. and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, uh, the Eikenberries? Hi, this is Suzanne Eikenberry. First off, welcome. We're really excited that you're here. You asked a couple things at the beginning, things Montpelier has done right. One of the things that's been phenomenal is that Tony made this commitment to get um, people into rehab who requested it. And I really want to see that continue. Something I'm excited that you're instituting is this social worker. I'm very concerned that two people in this community of 8,000 have been shot to death in the last two years, both of whom suffered from mental health issues. And that, to me, says that there's been a failure in the system. Um, and then my third concern is the school resource officer. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that. I heard. Um, there was a young gentleman from Montpelier who spoke at the Black Lives Matter rally here in Montpelier and specifically talked about an interaction with the SRO here in Montpelier. It wasn't, didn't happen on the school grounds, but it was, it was a pretty awful interaction. And when I think about eventually my son going to school and my friends' kids who have, you know, suffer from, from um, different abilities, I'm very worried about the SRO position. I understand. Um, first, with with the social worker, if I made that was I, I didn't in, that was not my brainchild. That was something that was in the works well before um, they even posted the position. So Tony and Mary and uh, uh, Gordon uh, and and their teams have it was something that they they recognize a strong need for. I think I'm going to do my best to expound on that by adding to the team two concept, which is. Um, uh, more like, again, tr training for crisis intervention to work to de-escalate the situation for the safety of the person as well as for the officers and for the community. And I'm going to try to bring in the CIT plan. And actually, in, in one of these, these USB ports, I actually have the class. And I'm not going to go out to another place to spend $4,000 to do it. We're going to develop that training, and we're going to do it for free right here in Montpelier and invite other officers to come do that. For um, um, getting help, rehabilitation, for people who are suffering from addiction, I, that is extremely huge to me. I, I would be, I don't think there's, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I don't think there's one person on this call who hasn't been affected by addiction in some way, shape or form. Whether you've lost uh, an uncle or um, a, a nephew to addiction, um, th these are situations that people need help, they don't need prison. They don't need prison to exacerbate a problem to make things worse for that person or worse for that family. 
So um, I'm not after people who are suffering from addiction. I'm doing my best to get them help. I'm after the bastards who are pushing that poison in our community. Um, uh, and again, if I offend anybody with that word, I'm sorry, but that's just how I feel. Um, uh, but we, th there are a lot of studies out there um, that say the positive, if, if there's a positive interaction with, with somebody in law enforcement, somebody who's suffering from mental, uh, from, from addiction issues, if there's a positive interaction, the chances and the likelihood of them getting help are higher than if we just came in there, oh, you're, you're an addict, you're, you're beneath my heel, you're scum of the earth or anything else like that. You know, Jesus, these are people. And we need to make sure we all understand we're, that, that these are people. We need to not get lost in our cynicism, or our darkness, or uh, that that's the other huge thing that we have to bring in here, which Tony has done a very good job with, which is officer wellness. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, and if we have a system that perpetuates this type of mentality, then we're going to have officers that are going to go out there and they're going to take it out on the people they're sworn to protect. And we can't have that. So I need to take care of, of them. And it's incumbent upon me to protect them and do everything I can for them and their families. So, so yes, with addiction, absolutely 100%. I'm going to take the baton Tony gave me and I'm going to run with it as fast as I possibly can. And, um, and with the SRO program, uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, another tricky situation because it all depends on people's experiences and what they've had dealing with SROs. I've had mixed experience dealing with SRO myself growing up. Um, but, I, but I do know what's possible and I think it depends on the culture and it especially depends on the person who's put into that position. Now, there are some things I think that we can do to soften up those appearances. Have an SRO with an unmarked car, have an SRO in regular clothes, and have an SRO, most importantly, that's, that is empathetic and understand patient enough to deal with young people. Not somebody who's going to fly off the handle, not RoboCop, not Tackleberry, not any of those other. You have to have the right person there. And, and I think that SROs can be extremely um, benefit uh, people. The program is a very, very, very good program, um, if anything, because it's another set of eyes. They shouldn't take the place of a counselor. They shouldn't take the place of a social worker or a teacher. But we have to understand that teachers, and, and, and I don't think it's happening here in this school district, but in other places it is. If there are conflicts that are going on in the classroom, some of the teachers, the first things they say is, I'm not getting involved, call the cops to come in here. Now again, it's a, it's a cop that's coming here dealing with two kids fighting each other. That's that not gonna go well. You know, wh why call a cop to do that type of thing? Um, but I think it's another set of eyes. It, you know, we have to have the boundaries that we have to understand what it is we're gonna get involved in and what we're not gonna get involved in. And, and another set of eyes to realize that if, for example, if we had uh, to, to call for a welfare check on one house and we went there and there was evidence of domestic violence going on in the house, and one of the officers notices, hey, and again, that's where that community involvement comes from, but that's, that, that's, that's Billy. I know him, and I know he's in the fourth grade. And then Billy can, then that officer can reach out to the SRO, tell them about the call that we've been on. The SROs can go to the teachers, they can go to the principal, they can go to the counselors and say, hey, our, our department, and keeping in mind any HIPAA violations or, or uh, protecting the rights um, that, that, that are, were required to do by state and federal and municipal mandates, but be part of a collective team to say that this is what we're seeing, this is what we think is going on in the house. And we need to focus all of our resources. So if anything, I think an SRO, if done correctly and done properly, of which I have all the faith in our school board system here um, with, uh, Liberty, uh, with Libby, uh, who's the superintendent, and with who we have selected for our SRO, I have all the faith in the world that these are going to be kind, compassionate people who want to go in there to help and not go in there to push, push kids around or to make the experiences worse. Did you listen to that story at the... Did you listen to the story at the Black Lives Matter rally? I was quarantined. I didn't get a chance to listen. It's online. I will send you the link. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. I was on the um, served on the the Taser committee that we had a few years ago, and we discussed the school resource officers and stuff. And I don't remember exactly when they first started having a school resource officer. But I 
do think the first one we had was uh, Mark Moody. And yes, he was superb. Um, he knew all the kids, the kids knew him. And um, I think they're, it, it's been a long time since I was in school. Um, <laughs> I think there, um, there were some instances where because we had the school resource officer and because he was connected to the kids um, extremely well, that things were prevented that may have otherwise ended up in a bad situation. Um, and, and if, and, and, I think it's the training and the personalities. Um, it, it takes a special kind of person to be able to do that. It, it does, and, and for and I, I think that in. For every bad story, every bad experience with SROs, there are some positive ones as well. And uh, so I think that's what makes it ultimately come down to, um, to again, the person that's put into that position, the level of training, the level of empathy and everything else that goes into it. I was, was made aware of, of a situation I think that happened a few years ago in which um, I think at the high school, there was a senior prank, something that um, there was like, a, I think there were painting stuff on walls or something to that effect or whatnot. And then uh, when the police got called to arrive or got, got called to come out there to respond, I think they thought they were responding to a burglary or something like to that effect. And then they actually spiked all the tires of the police cruisers that responded. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, that, from what I understand that happened several years ago and it cost thousands of taxpayer dollars to- Wow, I wonder how I missed students. that. But none of, the, none of the kids were arrested. Yeah. None of the kids were arrested. They 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 got it got moved to a situation that it was um, for the uh, the CJC, and yeah. so it, th there was a converse, conversation there. I think there was restitution involved, and it moved forward. No no yeah. no for for a prank like that, nobody went to jail for it. Nobody's uh, lives were upended, or did it go to a to a pipeline? Now I can't say that happens all the time because for every story I give you like that, somebody's going to say, "Well, my experience has been this." But I think what it ultimately boils down to is we want the opportunity to develop that trust. And when, when I was researching for this job, uh, I was looking for every bad thing I could find. I was going through Facebook posts, front porch forums, uh, everything to find out any rumor I could about uh, officers or staff. And I never heard anything negative or negative experiences regarding, that's not saying they didn't happen, but with the SRO program. So. I just want the opportunity to continue a program that I think um, so far that we've, we've done a doggone good job of, um, of will we make mistakes? Yes, absolutely. But, um, they but I, have, I have a process question. I, I've been waiting to ask a second question and I see there are 25 people on here and I don't want to cut in front of anybody else. So it's just in terms of taking turns, asking questions is um, it, it, what's the protocol? Okay, I apologize about that. Then yeah, part of it's I talk too much. So let me shut up. And then I guess if it's uh, uh, from what I'm understanding, if if you're if you have a camera, if you can do a hand raise or hit one of the uh, the emojis to show. So I think Ken, you said you had a question. Then I see uh, uh, Carolyn. Um, then Carolyn, please. So Ken, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, and forgive me. I just. Uh... No, no, I apologize for that. That's my fault. Um, I just, I just wanted to, you know, so I'm on the homelessness task force and one of the things we're advocating for are what's called peer outreach, which is people who have lived experience homeless reaching other homeless people. And it's a, it's a model that works quite well and it allows trust, trusting relationships. Um, so we're, we're going to be in conversation with you all. And I have been previously with Tony and, folks on council about how the peer outreach workers interact with the social workers um, as well as with the department. Um, and I, and so I, I just wanted to just mention that in the, in the context of the social worker, because there are a whole group of people who, who don't react well when they know it's a social worker or it's somebody's from Washington County. Folks have had been traumatized by the system had bad experiences. So I, I just, and, and there are, um, 
there is a police sergeant in Berlin who does a lot of outreach work with the homeless behind the price That's shop. Chad. Chad Bissett. Yeah. And I, I don't He's know if you're great. familiar with these sort of policing techniques or, or, or with these sort of work and and in your openness to learning how you know working with that. Approach. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, the, those things are the best work, especially peer support agencies. One of the other one of the best practices, especially when you're dealing with, again, mental health crises is, is to not only have a social worker, but have a peer. Somebody who also has that same lived experience that can be there to help um, help with with the current situation that somebody's experiencing. So yeah, I am a huge advocate for something like that. And anything I can possibly do to help push that forward. Um, you count me in there. I'll be the first one in line with you. Chad is the go-to person. Chad's fantastic. Chad in yeah. Berlin, I will put that down. Oh, you got to meet him. He is incredible. He knows everybody and he takes, nobody takes care of the homeless and challenged like he does. Nobody in this, will, in this whole area takes care of him like he does. I will connect with Chad, I promise. Oh, absolutely. Lauren, you had something that you wanted to say? I thought we were going no, to Carolyn. Carolyn, I'm sorry. I, your picture moved from right there to right there. That's, <laughs> That's okay. No, I, I, I don't have any questions right now. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, different, oh. different Carolyn. You're not the only Carolyn on the call. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Chief Beat. I'm Carolyn Wesley. I wanted to introduce myself. I live in Montpelier with my husband and my 15-month-old daughter. I've lived in town for nine years. Congratulations. And thank you. And your daughter, yeah. um, yeah, she's a hoot. Um, and also want to start by welcoming you and your family to Montpelier. And, you know, I am getting involved sort of newly in community conversations around policing. And I am drawn to that conversation because I feel really called to do whatever I can to help make Vermont a place where people of color can thrive. And certainly, as you know, we're hearing nationally, and I think also locally, that policing is one place where we have work to do to make that possible. Um, but I also want to start by saying that one of the things I hear first and foremost from Black Vermonters and others about how we do that is the importance of representative leadership. And um, I have an acquaintance who was raised in Vermont with Black parents who was just posting on Facebook about how she did not meet a Black adult until she was in second grade and throughout her childhood could count the number of Black adults she knew on one hand and felt um, how different her kind of experience her own internalized racism, her sense of comfort in her own skin would have been if she had had black role models. So I wanna start by just acknowledging the importance of your leadership position in Montpelier and my deepest hope that um, you find it to be a supportive work environment and that your family finds it to be a supportive place to live. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, and we do know that the uh, criminal justice system is a place where systemic well, racism is showing up and there's work to do. And I am sort of listening to calls um, happening across the country around what alternatives to policing might look like. That's a new area of thinking for me. It doesn't come naturally, but I'm also someone who hasn't had to have a lot of um, interactions with the police in my life. So I'm open to thinking differently about it. And I, I guess my question for you is, as someone who is working to improve police culture from within, where do you see common ground with people who are calling to defund the police and what might that mean in our community? Um, I, I definitely see common ground in looking at, and, and I, I wouldn't even say necessarily reimagining the police. I'd say is redistributing what the responsibilities and the expectations are. And, and, and again, for, for, for decades, people in law enforcement have been saying, um, we don't need to be responding to these types of calls for service. We shouldn't be there. Um, and again, that's not to say that, hey, you know, we've been telling everybody, so it's on you because we got called to do it. So, you know, eat it. No, I mean, we have a responsibility to train and be the best we can to be versed to deal with any situation that we possibly may encounter. So, so that is huge for us. Um, but I, I think um, with, with that calling, I think it comes to um, with those common grounds, it comes to be it comes to redefining what the expectations are of a police department and in and, and, and a broad education of the public as to where, you know, 
who should be doing what when we're when we're dealing with these types of calls for service and um and and to find that funding and that's one of those easier said than things are easier said than done things unfortunately because it's just every, every year you know my 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 uh, minor or my major in, in college was sociology employment relations and a minor in psychology and then i then I, I almost got my counseling degree twice but 9 11 hit and then my daughter was born on the second time i almost graduated with it but i did get my master's in police psychology so social services is huge to me because it's just every year just no matter what state you're in it's slash that's the first thing that you go to and um people need help Families need help to, to deal with a lot of this. The, the struggles are real. Um, so, but I think that um, we, we need to reinvest into our communities, into our social service agencies and functions and healthcare. Can I um, chime in? Uh, yes, Lauren, and then I think Allison, I saw. Awesome. I have a kind of a few questions I'd love to ask you, but just I'll pop one in right now because um, there's a great segue there. Uh, first, I just want to say also welcome to town. Um, this is this must be like the most difficult time in all of policing to um, be chief at a new department. Uh, no, thank you. But can I say something real quick about that, though? I, I feel blessed about that because of the level. And I'm not saying this to suck up to anybody to be corny, but I feel blessed about that because of the level of engagement and heart that I see in, in everybody here. So I don't to me, it's not going to be difficult. I got it better than other people because I, I think I'm talking to people who want to hold me accountable and be honest and truthful what we what we need to do to fix. So I'm grateful for it. That's awesome. Um, so <clears throat> I've kind of been <clears throat> reading some of your responses to, to all of this, and I did see you say that you thought, you know, defunding the police would be a terrible idea. And I know that um, that language is really strong for a lot of people, um, but I also know that the main kind of ethos behind it is this idea of swapping out public safety from a system that prioritizes the management of crime to one that prevents crime through supporting social services um, so that all communities can enjoy the, the kind of um, basic dignity and rights of everybody else. Right. Uh, and, you know, just what you're saying about your passion for social service and how we just see they're the first thing that gets cut every time. Um, you know, when we talk about looking at these budgets and trying to put our priorities where our heart is, uh, it just seems like we need to like we need to correct something really important there. And until we do, you know, if we're prioritizing the management of crime that we've basically created by neglect, um, I don't know, I don't see another way out of this problem. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on kind of what, what's so terrible about a system that um, puts social services first and as such reduces crime and, and doesn't need police in the way we need police now. So I'll, I'll I don't think it's, I don't think it's terrible at all. I think that uh, what I, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is when I hear, hear that ethos, I'm in all in favor of, um, of, of recategorizing calls for service and what the boundaries are and what police should be responding to. I just don't want to get lost in that, in that individuals who may be trying to label that movement. There's confusion on my part that, you know, when, when I hear it, I hear people saying, no, it's, it's, it's prioritizing funding. And then there's another group that's saying, no, I'm talking about eradicate the police entirely. So I'm just trying to avoid being part of that conversation. But in just saying that when it comes to reprioritizing what we respond to, absolutely. But I think there's a, there's a false sense of security in some cases when social services and everything, it's not going to always be like the total fix. You have, it, it should be, yeah, we, we definitely need more counselors and social workers and, and folks out there to, to do that type of work, but there are always going to be instances, unfortunately, and it's not always people who are in mental health um, or who are experiencing those crises who are going to commit crimes. There are other people that are um, that some are inherently bad, and, and again, we have to be able to differentiate who needs help who has an addiction issue and who's inherently bad. 
And uh, so I, I am totally for that. But in, in looking at defunding the police, it's it, in, in, in every agency that I've been a part of so far, with the exception of Chicago, whose budget has always just kept going, going up. And there's a, I can get into a whole three day conversation about that, but their budgets have shrank as well. And, and I just want to be cautious about that because um, defund, robbing Peter to pay Paul in this instance, there's going to be an unintended consequence. So there's going to be reduced police services and expectations, uh, a less quality, um, uh, you know, applicant, if you will, that may want to come uh, come to the department. So so there there are risks there. If you you take from from here to fund here, it's not going to be enough to nowhere near enough to be to fund from here. And then you're taking budgets from a place that's barely barely making it on its own. That's how I that's how I see it. Yeah, I guess it's not my impression that anybody's really talking about stripping the police of funding and, and not doing anything else, because that does sound like a terrible idea. Um, but I think the, the dialogue is really about doing both, like kind of like what the Burlington City Council just did um, in heeding the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance's demands by investing in communities of color and other underserved communities, and also pulling funding from the Burlington Police. Um, and that's something I would love to see here in Montpelier. I understand your point. Allison, I'm sorry, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, hi, I'm Allison. I actually live in East Montpelier, um, close to Morse Farm, which you guys talked about earlier, <laughs> the maple syrup. Um, welcome to Montpelier. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Um, my question is about something that someone actually brought up a little bit earlier. Officer Chad Bean fatally shot Mark Johnson in Montpelier last summer and was back to work before the investigation was even concluded. Do you think Officer Bean should remain on the police force? Do you believe these officers can continue to serve the people with trust and compassion given their past actions? And how do you plan to lead the force in a way that reduces the likelihood of these tragedies? I absolutely think that uh, Officer Bean should be on the force and an officer that were involved in that situation. Um, and uh, I, I stand by the decision um, and, and what those findings are from what I understand them to be. And I, 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 yeah, I would, I have the utmost faith and confidence and not only officer being with every officer in this department, haven't been fortunate enough to sit down and talk with them. Um, I, I believe I know where their hearts are. And, and I know that um, those situations are unfortunate and uh, nobody wins. When, when, when something like that happens. And no, nobody wants to go, no sane person that I've ever met wants to go out there and find themselves into those types of situations because they're scary. And then you have to think about how families are dealing with it and everything else like that. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I absolutely stand by them and support them. And, uh, and, but to keep it from happening again, I would, um, and, but first let me say this as well, uh, to Mark's family, you know, that, that's tough uh, to, to lose, um, perhaps just for something like that to happen, his friends and family, and it's tragic. And, uh, and, and as I'm sitting here and as I'm talking to the officers that were involved in all this, and I'm thinking, by God, what can I do to make sure something like this never ever happens again? Is there anything that we missed? Is there anything that we can bring to make sure that this doesn't happen again? So I, I don't know what that answer is. I, I hope to God it never happens again, especially in Montpelier. Um, but I, I know that what I wanna do is just to bring in more, more opportunity, more exposure, um, and um, to, to hopefully to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. And, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't know if that answered your question. I'd just like to chime in with uh, with uh, with Chad Bean. I mean, this wasn't the first time that he specifically has uh, been related, uh, has caused or been somehow related to uh, the death of someone in our community. Back in 2012, there was a domestic dispute that he responded to and uh, his use of force um, resulted in, or maybe not directly resulted, but the death of one of those individuals involved in that disturbance happened on his watch. So, I mean, this isn't his first time using force. I'm curious, what about people that have these histories of violence against people in our community? Why would you want to keep someone like that on the force? I mean, I think there's a level of, there's, there, there's, there's a level, there's, you, I have to look at what these early warning systems are. To my knowledge, there's not anyone um, 
that's on this department that is that has a has a repeated um, issue. I mean, things happen, unfortunately, in this job, and we find ourselves in very, very undesirable situations. And um, so it's uh, I, I take all that into account. And uh, but I, I have I haven't seen any anything here or well, we? any person that gives me significant pause is I think that their mentality is one to go out there and not to serve, but to go out well. just to be the big, bad, know it all cop um, that just wants to bully people. I, I haven't seen that personally since I've been here. But if I do find that, uh, then we take steps to eliminate that position as fast as possible. And, and I, what I understand again about this, this department is the culture ostracizes that, that the culture is, we don't stand for that. And, and you know, in, in other places it's, it's, you know, it's, Hey, you know, what are you doing? Why are you being nice to that person, blank that person or anything else like that? This culture is one of why, why don't talk to him or her like that. And if you do it the next time, X, Y, or Z is going to happen. Um, and, 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 but, but unfortunately, from what I understand and what I've seen, that hasn't happened much because of the screening process and the hiring process that um, has been in place here to make sure that we get the right fit and the right mold for our department. Right. But would you actually have the power to, to take that into account? I mean, the collective bargaining agreements are, are pretty strong for police officers. And, um, you know, usually collective bargaining agreements and police unions stand in the way uh, of institutional changes and, and policing. Um, so, you know, in our neighboring city of Barry, I think like someone earlier mentioned, they're starting a police oversight board. Um, and, you know, just to say, I worked as a professional investigator uh, at a police oversight board uh, in my past. So I've got experience with that. And, you know, with that experience, I can tell you that those police oversight boards really don't have much power or really do anything because of the collective bargaining agreements. So um, what's your stance on renegotiating the collective bargaining agreement, specifically section six here in our collective bargaining agreement to make the case accountable I'm for, for there? I'm sorry, could you, ref, could you, ref, uh, I don't have that in front of me. Which one is section six? Uh, that's the one regarding discipline, um, okay. disciplinary actions. Would you be, um, would you renegotiate that and give yourself more power over that and be actually able to, to discipline and remove officers if necessary and make those proceedings public? and make the records of those public. I, I gotta be very careful on how I answer that one because to my understanding that there are, because, because of those, are th those would I renegotiate them? If I saw something and I don't, have it, I don't have it in front of me, so I have to apologize about that one. But I'd have to look at it to see which specific issue may become a hindrance to us, find, you know, if we have a problem here, to us getting rid of that person. So I have to read up on that and I'll definitely get back to you um, on that one. Um, so if, if there is a specific problem to that, then yeah, I'll make that known. But I also have to be cognizant to work currently within the confines of what's already been agreed upon by law, as well as any, you know, to protect the, the, um, the, the rights of that individual who's going through. Because a lot of times, um, just as a lot of times that somebody does something wrong, there's a, there's a lot of other times that somebody's, uh, you know, didn't do anything wrong at all. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky situation on that one. But am I, am, am I opposed of getting rid of bad people? Oh, hell no. Anyone who's bad, I don't want them to continue tarnishing um, what we do here. And I don't want them to have an ex to, 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 to treat my wife or my daughter, my mother and my father, um, you know, the way they would treat anyone else. Well, also, what about having more accountability for them? For example, Article 22 of the uh, Collective Bargaining Agreement uh, provides individual uh, liability insurance and false arrest insurance for police officers, which kind of makes them unaccountable for their actions. It, it shifts that that burden to us, the taxpayers in this city, for, for any actions of the police. Would you um, kind of renegotiate that and make them accountable for their own actions? Brian, uh, Brian I'm going to jump in here. I vowed I wasn't going to say anything. But there, are, <laughs> there are mandatory subjects of um, collective bargaining that Brian probably isn't even familiar with. He has never okay. negotiated these contracts. I have. Um, that's pretty much a professional requirement in this profession uh, because people could also be falsely accused of things and have to have to bear those costs just like uh, most professions have you know lawyers doctors whatever have professional liability insurances um, with regard to individual cases such as officer beans those are personal matters I think those cases the results of those cases have been made public and investigated pretty uh, severely I'd also point out that Vermont in general is a very labor-friendly state, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. 
but public employment in general is considered a property right and to just dismiss someone summarily is against the law. Uh, and police officers uh, in the state actually have an, uh, an additional level that most employees don't. There is a requirement for public hearing if they choose. Our contract actually allows for arbitration instead of that public hearing where it goes to an arbitrator, but we cannot actually terminate an officer um, on our own um, if they choose to appeal and it goes to a third party, in which case we have to prove um, basically almost to a court standard, a just cause standard. Uh, so uh, yes, I understand all the concerns. I would say that by and large, our, our police union, uh, I would say more than by and large, overwhelmingly, they have supported the types of measures that Brian and Tony have talked about and uh, do try to, to police their own bad, uh, bad pun there. But um, as Brian said, they don't uh, tolerate. And when there has been someone who didn't fit in, um, they've actually, we've, you know, we, we, we've actually had officers testify against fellow officers in here, in arbitration hearings. Um, so, I, I, you know, I can't really go into details because of the nature of them, but I, I, it's not as, you know, it would be great if we just said, hey, sure, let's get rid of them all. But it's, it's, there's a lot more legal, more legal stuff. So hope that, I'm not saying that to argue with you, Constantinos. I just want to try to inform the conversation that that there are there's a larger universe of things. All right, I'm going to go back to being yeah. quiet. Now. No, I understand that. But you know, in terms of the insurance, you know, doctors do pay for their own um, insurance. It's not, you know, a lot of times they don't. It's not provided by their employer because it's their own actions that they're going to be responsible for. Just want to make that point. Okay. Don't totally understood. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Vicki, did I see you have your yeah. hand? Um, I, I wanted to add a couple of things and I had a question from a long time ago, um, but I think that discussion, you know, the discussion of the, um, the powers that the collective bargaining or the unions have is, is a bigger question and a bigger issue than just Montpelier. I think that's something that, um, that United States wide or nationwide is is something that that needs to be addressed. Um, although I will have to say that I'm not a, a big union fan. Um, so, but I think um, you know I think that that needs looked at. Um, I mean, we did hear a few chiefs over you know throughout the nation talk about how difficult it was to get rid of. Um, and to discipline officers that just weren't appropriate. Um, and it needs to be made more, um, it needs to be made easier for them to have more authority over, I mean, they're the ones and other police officers that have to work with these officers are the ones that are closest to it. And, um, you know, it doesn't do any service to anyone. And I've, I've heard stories of where the, the some of the black officers, um, are being intimidated by some of the white officers, and that's not right. Um, and and the unions don't do anything about it. Um, so I mean, those things are not right at all. Um, but the other question I had was, on the on the school resource officer. Um, do the kids have a chance or an opportunity or a, a way to, um, to assess the performance of the school resource officer? Uh, that's a very good, that's a very good uh, a question. Um, I can give you my off the cuff answer, but I want to go back really quick to the, to the union part. Um, while I do understand that there are a lot of other places in the country that are experiencing these, these, these difficulties with unions, uh, I don't think Montpelier is one of them at this particular point. No, I don't think so either. Okay. And so, yeah, I mean, they, they definitely do have their challenges and, and yeah, I think it's, there, there, there are some institutional uh, conversations to be had about that. Um, but uh, I, I think currently here, here at home, I think uh, you have a very, very strong department who's who's yeah. who's anchored well we sort of live in a little bubble in montpelier i will we'll, i'll take it <laughs> we're, we're I'll take they it. did they did tell you that we're also known as Montpelier. 
Yep, Have they not peculiar, told you most that? polite. I don't care. We'll take it all. That you know, to Mont me. peculiar. You have to be a little <laughs> peculiar to be here. Trust me, I am <laughs> peculiar. Um, so yeah, with with the SROs, I, I, I think that's a that's a very good uh, that's a very good question. I think that that, that that's going to require some in depth thought. The, the thing that gives me immediate pause about that is um, I'm not sure if um, that would. I think that would be something more to side towards a school board or towards towards the schools itself. But I'm a little hesitant about putting a lot of weight on what a child may may deal with when it comes to a police officer. Uh, well, yeah, I think that there needs to be some type of feedback or or, or some type of input. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that that would that should be baked into into currently what we're doing. But um, I, I think it would. It, it, and I'm sorry, but, but I think one of the conversations for the school board meeting was that the school board actually, I mean, they, they wanted to, to have a very in-depth discussion about it, and they wanted to find out what some of the other teachers and principals, and especially some of the students, especially students of color, um, were saying yeah. about their current experiences. So I give them a, a huge amount of, of, of credit um, for, for trying to draw that conversation out. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a part of accountability, and that's something that needs to be looked at. I mean, I think it would be nice if the especially the the older kids i mean mm -hmm. the ones that are in high school would they have the ability to you know think about that if they had a feedback form or something that went directly to you um i mean he's a police officer and it there's there was a large you know, there's been issue. There's been discussions on who should foot the bill for that police officer um, over the years. You know, should it be in the school budget? Should it be in the municipal budget? You know, should it be 50-50, whatever. Um, but I think if there's an issue um, with the school resource officer that is an important issue, it would come back in just a volume of you know, things from the kids. I mean, they didn't, it would have to be a confidential thing, but if 50 kids said, you know, this guy's really a bully, he's not good, he's not listening to me, then maybe there's something that needs to be taken, that needs to have some look at. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the kids are the ones that are interacting with him. If he's not meeting their needs, that's, that's you a, know, that's that's a that's a very very good point, and, I, and uh, next time I get uh, get get the opportunity to speak with Libby, um, I'll definitely uh, bring that up. Because so. he he should be meeting the needs of the kids, mm -hmm. not just the needs. Of, I mean, he's there for the kids. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's my understanding. I mean, I, I growing up, I never had experience with police officers in schools. The only time a police officer ever came into our school um, in Windsor was when one of my classmates <laughs> um, <laughs> punched a teacher out. <laughs> and, and, and that's the things that we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid to the point that we, that we want to have, that we want to have interactions when they're positive, not always when yeah. they're I mean, we never, if the police were in, in the schools, that was a big deal. Um, it just, it never happened, never. I'll definitely get to work on that. But that was in the 70s and the early <laughs> 60s. The 60s and early 70s, it's been a few years. <laughs> Vermont in the 60s. So are there any, I am more than willing to stay on to, to discuss anything with anybody who, who wants to, um, but I know in, in some cases it's 751. Um, are, are there any other questions or concerns or challenges or anything else that that uh, that, that that anyone would like to talk to? Or if if you want to to continue on some conversations that you know in uh, more intimate settings, um, by all means, I, I'm ready to, to 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 have these conversations or these meetings at any time and place that's going to be more conducive for any anyone. Um, Sorry, there's a question in the chat. If, uh, okay, if you Mr. Keegan, take a look at those. But. Okay, I apologize about that. I knew all that. Um, it's a question. Which, okay, is it the institution of policing is necessary? Can I imagine the responsibilities interred? Is that the question? 
Well, there's several questions, but yeah, that's one of the ones that I was curious about your answer as well. Okay, um, is it okay if I go to, to Colin real quick and then if there are no other questions, then I'll go down each of these and I'll answer them to the best that I can? Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Keegan, sir. Sure, um, first of all, welcome. Um, I used to live in Montpelier. I live in Burlington now, I still work there. Uh, so, you know, member of the community in the day. Um, I One of the reasons I popped on was to flag your attention to the chat. So, uh, okay, just feel free to spend some time on that. I guess my other thing, this is obviously bigger than Montpelier. Um, I just, we're kind of within the conversation of accountability. Um, what's your take on qualified immunity? I know that there's been a lot in the news lately with the Supreme Court uh, and judicial legislating in some way and uh, between the collective bargaining agreements and the power within the department and then obviously the way policing is structured overall. Uh, there, there are multiple layers of protection for officers that uh, probably shouldn't be on the force. Uh, and then there's also different ways to hold them accountable. So it's a long way of just asking your asking your opinion on what should happen about qualified immunity. I think I think qualified immunity is is it, it needs to stay. Um, it, there are also provisions built into qualified immunity that um, it's not just because, hey, if you've if you've been involved in, let's say, for example, a deadly force incident, you've been involved, so you're automatically um, absolved of it. You know, there's no responsibility. There's 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 criminal and there's civil um, liabilities that you're also looking at. There's a four prong test, um, and and these are qualified immunity is something that's that's baked into Supreme Court law, or so, and, and basically on case law. And so, I, I think that there there are provisions that are in there that 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 do hold officers accountable. Um, my, my my issue with what qualified immunity is is what are the accountability systems in place that make sure that the truth comes out um, for an investigation. So for example, if you have a shooting and you know, um, you know, are, are there accountability systems that are in place to make sure that the truth comes out, that there's no, that you know, you're not manipulating paperwork or casework or, or things to that, you know, egregious factor that's that's going to um, include those factors that, you know, those exception rules, the, the exceptions to the rules. So I think that uh, wh where, where departments have to be diligent at is to make sure that it's a culture and a system of accountability and different layers of supervision. And, um, you know, cause it's like that fraud triangle, right? That, you know, if you have, you know, you have motive and opportunity that, that it, it can't just be incumbent upon one layer. Okay, I'm the final authority. No, there has to be different layers and different levels of eyes to look at it. Um, and, and with Montpelier, we don't do our own in, internal investigations with officer-involved shootings. The state police does them. Um, so I, I think that qualified immunity is, is a definite must for the job, but it had the system has to be fair in getting the truth out and making sure that 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 those provisions are in place. Thanks. Um, I just had one thing. I wanted to thank you for your for your email of Monday night or Tuesday morning or whatever. Um, and I also hope that um, you'll still like Vermont um, during stick season and mud season. Stick season is between fall and winter and mud season is between winter and spring or spring and whatever anyway. Um, because Vermont is the very best state <laughs> in the nation. I'm, I'm, I'm digging. I may be partial, but. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm digging on it right now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've already been told to get some muck boots. I didn't know what muck boots were, but I know what they are now. And They're varying kinds. You can get the short ones or the, or the tall ones. Yes. <laughs> and mud season is every time it rains and my daughter comes inside the house. So it's oh, it gets worse. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to that. I'll be jumping out there in the mud with her. Stick season is kind of depressing. Oh, <laughs> well, then if I could, <laughs> let me go to uh, to some of the questions from the top. There are used there used to be a rural screening team that was part of Washington County Mental Health. They went out on calls for mental health crises. De escalation begins with the individual officer. Okay, um, Project Safe Catch is what you're talking about. Good program. People need drug re rehabilitation. Yes, absolutely. And how is locking up, putting away? Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. It shouldn't be locked up and put away. I'm learning more about rule three in the states and how the, um, 
how that um, the state itself uh, discourages um, uh, locking folks up to that extent, especially in other places. Um, in, in some, in a lot of other states, uh, you come across an incident, there's, uh, there's two people fighting, unless the officer saw it, um, then, then, you know, the only, it, it seems like the only three courses of action are a citation um, to be placed under arrest for photograph, fingerprinting, and then a citation and release, uh, or potentially a citation or uh, uh, the arrest and then incarceration, but the incarceration has to be determined by a judge. So from what I understand about the, uh, the state of Vermont, it's the judges that make the decision on if somebody's going to be held without bail for any significant amount of time and not the police department within the state as opposed to other states, say like for example, Illinois, where I can arrest somebody based on the uh, signed uh, sworn statement of someone else. Uh, let's see, hope to learn the SROs learns to deal with bullying. Oh, yeah, make sure our SROs uh, are, Aren't, aren't bullying, but also make sure that uh, we we adhere to training and that if and that we can provide some training to talk about bullying, especially things like cyberbullying, because um, we're seeing a lot of that nationwide. Thank you all very much for your welcomes. Uh, do I think the institution of policing is necessary? Yes, I, but I definitely would reimagine um, what our responsibilities and what what calls for service that we go to. Um, but it's going to be unfortunately, I think. Um, a slow transition because again, everything's intertwined. So it's gonna be a matter of other institutions or other agencies um, uh, having new policies, new money, new resources, new, new personnel, um, more personnel to enhance those, um, the services that they provide. Um, I think there is a benefit of maintaining a police agency because unfortunately a crime does happen and, um, and somebody has to respond to it. Um, it's, it's not always situations that require social workers um, or, or other um, uh, um, uh, community resource functions. Sometimes there, there, there are some very real things out there and there are some people out there who are experiencing things like domestic violence or child abuse or child endangerment. Those things do happen and somebody within the community has to respond to those. But again, that means we should, we, we have to make, make, take a look at what we're responding to and then working on with the community to get that agreement, that understanding that the police will not respond to these things, but um, here's where we wanna to go to from here. Um, the drug dealers are in many respects no different than the characterization of police often put forward. A few bad apples for the most part, okay. Structural organization, yes, it is structure. Um, so drug dealers in schools, um, uh, that's something I want to make sure that we're not willy-nilly and going in there and, and uh, you know, we, we want to make sure we're legitimate in what we understand and any suspicions that we may have. Uh, okay, thank you again for the welcome. Um, again, I think I answered that question about do I think policing is uh, institutions necessary? Um, let's see, additionally. I'm, I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, yes, we need me. more housing. Um, so I, I, had, I had had a chat on the side with the Ira who posted that question. Um, he, 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 he wanted sort of addressing of are, are these people bad people? Because you talked about going after the bastards. And I guess the point of his question was, are they really bad people? There's, in my experiences, you have people that are, um, that are, that are making the wrong decisions base of because they're forced necessity you know you 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 go into a situation a lot of times like um, for example in Chicago I, I don't know what it's like in, in Montpelier yet because I haven't been a, had a chance to go out there on the streets yet but um um in Chicago you, you're often dealing with people who are it's I, I don't I, I got locked up I can't get another job um, I wasn't able to finish school or I only have a high school education I don't have a car I can't do anything else um, if, if I don't, I would live on this neighborhood and, 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 and if, and if I don't sell dope, they're going to shoot me. So, so there, there are some cultural issues um, within those places, but there, there is also that understanding that some people are forced to do things that they otherwise would not do if they didn't find themselves in very unfortunate situations. So in those cases, um, we have to, we, you know, there is a responsibility, um, uh, to uphold the law, but at the same time, uh, it, 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 I think it's incumbent upon us as a society. It can't just be the work of the police themselves, but we have to identify that and 
send them up. I did have the chance to meet with Rory, uh, who is the uh, state's attorney for Washington County, and he is a very strong advocate for uh, differentiating what's going on with crime and what's going on with issues that aren't crime or necessarily something that can be solved by other means other than, than being pushed into the criminal justice system. So I think all the elements are here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, th there are, th th we, we have to distinguish these things and we have to, um, you know, the answer always isn't locking people up. So yeah, when I say bastards, I mean the people who are full out, straight up, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do dope. I don't care who I hurt. I don't care whose children are addicted to it. I don't care what I have to do to get more money because it's all about me, 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 and this is what I'm gonna do. Um, those are heartless people, but my heart goes out to people who find themselves in those unfortunate situations that they have to do something that, again, they otherwise wouldn't wanna do. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Yes, I've, can you? Sorry, we've got a few um, sound things going on here. He's gonna take the baby out of the way. <laughs> we're, we're double teaming this conversation to one household, two computers. Um, my name is Stephanie, I live in Montpelier. We've lived here for three and a half years. We have a young child and it's an incredible community. I welcome you too. <laughs> so Thank it's you. really great to have you. I will move away from that toy making annoying noise. Um, my question is about, well, to be brief, it's about things like Blue Lives Matter and this inability of police departments overall to engage in this type of discussion that you're engaging in in such a, a great way. And, you know, I find it incredibly upsetting that so many police officers take deep personal offense when the institution itself of policing is being critiqued. And I know as someone who's very much committed to um, creating a society where we do not need police, uh, my the issue would never be with an individual police officer or with you, you seem very kind and thoughtful, for example. And um, at a few city council meetings, I felt that people, um, the former chief seemed to take offense at a few critiques of the system at large and, and we weren't addressing him as an individual. I just wanna tell you that we wanna go forward and talk with you about these issues and really appreciate that you're, that you're able to engage with us. But how would you, um, how would you engage with, with that culture here in Montpelier or in Vermont overall, given your leadership position and you'd probably be talking to different cops in different places at different times. How do you think you could encourage them to, to have these types of discussions? And you know, I've seen Blue Lives Matter flags around here. I've, I've heard a lot of harmful rhetoric. I just don't think that everyone is like you and willing to have these discussions, which, which is, a, is really upsetting. And uh, you know, just the idea that someone's job would be such a, a per just talking about an institution so large would feel like such a personal attack on people. And I don't want that to be the case if we're all to move towards a better society. That, Talk together. That that's an that's a, a very deep, uh, profound question. And then thank you for the opportunity to answer it. Um, uh, and then first, thank you for for that um, for I, I, for the initial. Uh, trust, I guess I would say, um, for 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 um, uh, for this. Um, but I think with um, I think in some cases that yeah, I mean, well, not in some cases that they think that our institution has not had the best track record as possible, and um, so there's a lot of emotion. And, and in some of these settings, I've been asking people, what do I say to the officers who are upset? Because um, there's there's a there's a lot of there's anger on both sides. There's, 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 there's folks demanding accountability and demand that the institution itself change and our culture change by right. So there, there are police and police agencies that are saying, you know, yeah, our, our, our culture sucks. It must change everything else like that. But I feel like I'm getting lumped into and painting with being painted with the same brush. And, uh, and, and I think that's where some of that frustration comes out now. Is it the smartest thing to do? I think um, to, to push a dialogue because there's, it's going to force different things. Like just as my, my misunderstandings or misinterpretations is what I learned tonight about defunding the police is not actually about defunding the institution or abolishing the institution in this whole I think as a society that's what all of us should be working towards but um so there's there's that frustration and uh and there's hurt um in in in, in officers trying to figure out like I, I'm not that 
it, it can, may, may I use a, a, a bad word, a blunt word, if you have children in the room, um, but I've heard it from more than several people. I'm not that asshole murderer in Minneapolis. Why am I, why am I getting hate emails or why am I getting yelled at or why am I getting screamed at? Because it's like everything that I've done to do right um, it's just been forgotten about and I'm being labeled and painted with the same brush. So it's trying to navigate that and, and bring that down. And when you're saying blue lives matter, some people you're, you're missing the urgency of the situation of now. Nobody's not saying that blue lives, white lives, Hispanic lives don't matter. We're, it, it, it's society shining a light and saying right now, I think I heard it uh, last night in the, uh, in the city council meeting, they're talking about the situation of right now there's an issue going on right here and we need to focus our attention right here. Of course, everybody else's lives matter, but there's something institutionally and structurally wrong that's going on with people of color in the community, especially when it comes to policing institutions. So yes, yeah, so we cannot move from that conversation, but I think it, it's just some people just getting very emotional um, in, 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 a, in a zeal, in an effort to say, I'm not like that. And some people are doing it a little bit better than others. Um, so, so, but, but what I what I try to get folks um, is to do is to push past the all the all the chaff through that, and and to 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 really hone in on what what the, what the conversation is, and 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 I'm not going to lie to you. There have been times that that uh, that that I got upset. There there have been times that I you know got real down um, because it it does feel like a personal attack. But I, I talked to my wife. And, uh, and I talk to other people and I talk to my, my pastor and, and I try to try to get it put in perspective. And I ask those same questions of people who are, who want to hold me accountable. Where is this coming from? Um, and, and I think, I, I think I understand it. Uh, you know, I know I understand it, but I know it's a, it's a difficult place to be. And there, there are a lot of folks that say uh, it, it's not about any one individual person, but I think specifically for Montpelier it is because it has to be about one individual person. It has to be, uh, it has to be about me because I'm the one who's here, um, who's who, who's in this department, and and if my if my morals, my scruples, my character, and my sense of accountability um, are wrong, then by all means, I you will get me the get me out of here. Um, because that's not what it's supposed to be. But I think that while we have to have these national dialogues, at the same time, we can't be, we can't lose focus to, uh, and we have to bring each other up to, to realize that it's, you know, we need to focus on the institution as a whole and try to make sure that it's not, you know, I appreciate what this person is doing and this person is doing every day, but we all have a part to play, especially internally with our institution. And we do have to push the culture forward. And that's where I think Montpelier can excel at is to, uh, to make sure we do have these dialogues and to make sure that we come together with the communities we serve to find out what the solutions and the boundaries should be. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions, um, uh, challenges, ideas, or anything else that I can, I can answer? Okay, well, um, I know it's a long night uh, for a lot of folks and, and, and sincerely from the bottom of my heart, I wanna really thank you all very much for the tough questions, for the ideas. Um, and this will not be the last, uh, I wanna have several more of these. Uh, so I can again, solicit more feedback and then, then put our strategic goals and our plans out there um, so we can do our best to, to continue to reimmerse ourselves within our community and move forward. So thank you all very much uh, for your time. And again, if, and if anyone wants to have any conversations offline or any other place, please let me know and, uh, and I'll call you, I'll meet with you. Uh, doesn't matter when or where, but I'm here, I, I serve you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Thank yeah. you so thank much. You. Yes, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Go White Sox. <laughs> ah. Go Cubs! <laughs> <laughs>